Right, so uh, nice to see everybody. Uh, welcome to the final lecture of, uh, what's this course number? 6S955. Uh, so your final responsibility is very simple. It's a final exam. Um, so we've got, the final exam is what? It's next mm, Friday, Sorry, Thursday, Friday, Tuesday? Oh, I gotta write an exam by next Tuesday? Oh. Okay, well good to know. So your, your final exam is next Tuesday, so get ready for that. And your instructor, uh, of course, has already detailed uh, an extremely challenging exam with uh, lots of, of questions that I've thought of on it. Um, so, so there's that. So I guess uh, I'll certainly continue to have my office hours tomorrow. Uh, you know, if I'm employed, I could probably add one or two more uh, before your exam. Um, the format will be very similar to the midterm. You can have another page of notes. Um, it'll cover the entirety of the course, not just like the second half. Uh, so hopefully you all did the midterm revision on the last homework and, uh, you know, had a little more practice with the first half of the class, which is, you know, good, a good excuse to review uh, course content. Any questions about that? Okay. Well, uh, in our final lecture of this course, you guys uh, asked for more technical content instead of an uh, exam review, so that's, that's our plan. We have a tiny amount of ODE integration left to cover, so we'll do that first. And in the last little bit, I thought I'd tell you about one application of ODE integration in uh, the machine learning world, uh, which is directly applicable to what we're up to, and moreover, uh, introduces one additional kind of cool technical tool, which is something called the adjoint method, which is a strategy for differentiating into differential equations. Now, unlike the rest of this course, it is not in my textbook, and I did it this morning on a piece of scrap paper, so there's a high likelihood that we'll just get confused halfway through, call at the end of the course, and give up. So, get excited. Uh, so that's our, our plan for the day. Obviously, when it comes to your exam, only the, the part that's in the slide is, is relevant. Um, I thought it would be fun to make an exam question where you kind of derive the formulas that I'm likely to get wrong here. So we'll, we'll think about it. In any event, uh, right, so our story so far. Uh, we've developed all kinds of numerical methods for integrating and solving ordinary differential equations. Right? Uh, if you recall the last two lectures, we started with this equation. Um, with, this is a first order stationary uh, ordinary differential equation, right? So first order as a little bit of review means that there's one derivative here in y and then stationary because f does not depend on t. And if you recall, we kind of argued that we can take any ordinary differential equation and write it in this form at the cost of increasing the dimensionality of y. Yeah, a little bit of review. And that's what led us to all the basic integrators we, we, we derived like uh, forward and backward Euler, uh, Hoyne's method, exponential integration, uh, what are some other ones, uh, R, uh, RK integration, and so on. And then in our previous lecture, uh, we went on a bit of a, a, a circuitous route to derive integrators very specifically for a different style of ODE, which is Y double prime equals F of T, Y, Y prime. And the point here was that like, yes, it is absolutely true that a solver for the first guy also can be used to solve the second one, right? That's the point of the reductions we did two lectures ago. But that isn't to say that the best possible integrators for the second one are also the best possible integrators for the first one, right? Because we like know a little bit more structure here. Does that make sense? And in particular, if you recall, the basic point was that we ended up kind of introducing a temporary variable v, right? Which is just y prime. And the point was that we can actually approximate v with a lower, or, lower order of accuracy than y, and because it gets multiplied by h in our Taylor series, uh, we, we still get away with a higher accuracy integration over all. Right? So for example, when we derive the Newmark integrator, we could like do forward Euler for v, and then midpoint for, for uh, uh, y, and we'll kind of compose these two things together, and you still get an accurate integrator, even though like part of your integrator is, isn't so good. By the way, notice that means that you can't trust the v's that come out of this as much as, as the y's, which is kind of interesting. So that's our story so far, and we spent a lot of our previous lecture working very hard to derive a whole class of integrators for the second class of ODE, namely these Newmark things. And then like basically by plugging in different constants, I believe they were gamma and beta, we could derive different versions of integration that were explicit or, or implicit, have different degrees of accuracy, and, and so on. But that was our story. If the last lecture was a little bit gummy, that's because like, yeah, those, those, those derivations are no fun. They're easy to get wrong. Your instructor got them wrong a few times in the middle of the lecture. <laughs> the good news is that I don't think we've got them wrong in a serious way. <laughs> if you go through the, the book derivation, you'll see it's basically exactly what we did in class. Uh, for good reason, because I you know, wrote both. Okay, 
So uh, in this last little segment of, of, of our class, I thought I would tell you about one more class of integrators. And, and the reason to derive this particular one is that I actually think it is the most popular integrator for a lot of physics problems. Um, at least it's sort of the first thing to try, especially in kind of video game physics. And the reason is it's extremely easy to, to implement, for one, um, and the accuracy is relatively high. Now, the basic point here is that remember that one of the ways that we can get higher order accuracy is to use the centered difference approximation when it came to derivative. Uh, but there was a problem, which is that like center differences kind of don't make sense for ODE integrator because we kind of had everything marching on the same time step, right? So all of the ODE integrators we've talked about so far, if you think of like the time axis, right? So here's T, right? Then essentially what we do is, you know, we have like K equals zero, K equals one, K equals two, and so on. And at each one of these things, we have these rules for advancing like Y, zero and v zero and then we get y one v one and y two v two and so on right and so like the numeric integrators we derived are, are an example of that and then it's completely reasonable given our, our story so far but the problem is when we wanted to use midpoints to degradation like somehow we wanted like something here and we couldn't get it because like everything had to march at the same time and so there's like one more big idea in ODE integration that's worth covering in this class. And this idea is, is really simple. The basic point is that we've already figured out that by, by solving the second order ODE, you know, like basically by splitting off the V and the Y variables, we maybe can get some benefit out of that, like some efficiency and, and accuracy. But there's a second reason to do it, which is that we do not have to store V and Y at the same points in time. And that's what this last class of integrators does. This is a, a, like a, a very sneaky trick, which in retrospect is totally obvious in some sense. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to, uh, this is sometimes called like a uh, staggered grid, which is also sometimes a strategy for partial differential equations. It's basically the same thing. Uh, or a different one for the one-dimensional version is called leapfrog, which I think is cute. Um, and both of these integrators uh, use the same trick, which is to say, okay, what if we do the following? We're going to store the v's at the one-half time point. So we have v1 half, v3 halves, v5 halves, and so on, rather than storing the v's on the integer time points. Right? Now, what does that mean? That means when you plot this stuff, you've got to be really careful. <laughs> but at the end of the day, we still get y's at the same points in time anyway, and the v's are basically just temporary variables, so, so what difference? Does that make sense? And so that leads to this class of staggered grid or, or leapfrog integrators. Uh, and they're going to basically be able to do things like the midpoint rule because now V is at the midpoint of Y1 and Y2. You guys see that? Okay. So in particular, let's say that we want to um, derive such an integrator. We can do so in a few different pieces. So first we can use the midpoint rule to advance the Y's, which we already know is very accurate. Right? So in particular, maybe we do Y K plus 1 is equal to Y K plus H V K plus 1 half. Huh? Like that. Uh, and now how do we advance um, the V's? Well, remember that we can get away with low order accuracy for the V's, right? So in particular, one thing we do is just forward Euler, right? We could say, uh, or we can even attempt to do some kind of uh, leapfrog rule, but we're going to see that we run into a problem. So let's say that we want to do the, the leapfrog one first. Uh, uh, in particular, we have V of K plus... Uh, I guess three halves is probably the way to write it, is V K plus one half. Oops, sorry, that was <laughs> complete, even less legible than my normal writing. Um, K plus one half plus H A K plus one. Right, so now we're going to do leapfrog integration for the V's too. Right? Um, unfortunately, to compute the A's, we're going to end up incurring a bit of error, which is why um, maybe the V's aren't terribly accurate. Yes, Axel. Yeah. That's right. And in fact, this is the midpoint rule because of the place where the A's. Sneaky, huh? Yeah. And notice, by the way, we ended up back where we started <laughs> by doing this twice. Right? So by doing midpoint on the V's, the A's end up back on the Y's. Right? So like, the, like we have... A0, A1, yeah, right, because every time we do this, we kind of shift by a half. 
Okay, so in particular, uh, we're gonna we need one more thing, which is what is the a? Um, and here's a reasonable choice. Now here's the problem. So we've got t k plus one. That's fine, right? We can even put in x k plus one because all of these things are at the same point in time. The only problem is that we don't have a v at that time, right? And this is our place where we have to do one more approximation. Right? Uh, so in particular, what's proposed in these midpoint, uh, or, or rather these leapfrog integration uh, strategies is the following, v k plus one half plus v k plus three halves. So sadly for us, we do have to average the v's here uh, because we do need to evaluate f at one point in time. Make sense? So this thing is called the leapfrog integrator, and let's see what, what happens here. So to advance the v's, we need to know the y, uh, in order to get the next v, we need the previous half time step worth of, of, of a's, right? In order to advance uh, the y's, we need uh, the previous half time step worth of v's. So here's going to be the problem. So we have a k plus 1 depends on the v k plus 1 halves, right? So the reality is that this is actually an, uh, an implicit integrator. Do you see that? In order to get basically a k plus 1 and hence y k plus 1, right, I need to be able to solve a system that involves uh, the v k plus 1 half. So initially this integrator feels very expensive, and that's because it is. This is an implicit system here. It's, it's second order accurate, which is good, but, but implicit, which is kind of a pain. Everybody with me so far? However, there's one really special case of this that is the extremely popular one. Yes, Axel. Uh, sure. So a k plus 1 depends on v, k plus 1 half, and v k plus 3 halves. The 3 halves depends on the plus 1. That's right. OK. There's one special case of this integrator that I think is really the reason why it's so popular. Like this thing, as it is, is about equally annoying to all the other ones that we've derived so far. But there's one special case where this integrator is actually explicit and is extremely easy to implement and is very intuitive. Any ideas? Constant acceleration is a parabola, so we probably don't need an integrator for that. But that is a special case, <laughs> a special case of our special case. In particular, there are a lot of physical systems where all of the forces come from just position. Think about springs, right? So like springs don't depend on the velocity. This is different than air resistance, which does. Yeah? So if you all depend only on position, this third term goes away. OK? And now think, look, at, look at the dependency chain. <laughs> Right? So now, to get this guy, I need v k plus 1 half and a k plus 1. In order to get this guy, I need v k plus 1 half um, and, and the previous y. So here's essentially what this integrator looks like. So I have, in fact, let's kind of expand our diagram a little bit. So let's say that I do, um, so as my initial data, I have y 0 and I have v 0. Okay, and I use whatever my favorite little, like it doesn't actually really matter because it's just one little tiny step to do a half a time step to get v one half. Okay. Now, what can I get and what can't I get here? Like remember, who depends on what? So, so let's take a look. So we have vk plus one half, that depends on ak plus one, we don't have that yet. But, but let's say, uh, first of all, can I get a zero? Absolutely, because it depends on x zero and t zero, right? Okay, great. So we have that, right? Okay, fantastic. Now, can I get, uh, how about y one? Well, I have v one half, right? So using v one half, and why not? I can get y1. Does that make sense? That's the first into this uh, this first formula here. With me so far? Okay, fantastic. Remember the a's only depend on the y's, right? So now, from y1, I can get a1. Cool. Okay, fantastic. Now I have a1. Notice that I can go from one half to three halves using a1, right? 
So from A1, I can get V3 half. Cool? Okay. Now what? Yeah, now I can get y2, right? Because y2, I just add h times v 3 half, right? Now, from y2, I can get a2, right? Because a is just a function of the y. Now that I have this, I can leapfrog the v to 5 half, and so on, right? So this is why it's called leapfrog integration, because it's basically ping-ponging between the y's and the v's, and the y's and the v's, like that. So this is an extremely easy thing to implement. It's uh, basically a good implementation of many different physical models. <laughs> Once you add the dependency on V, that's where the headache comes from. By the way, you could do something lame, like just slice out this second term, but then you lose an order of accuracy. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, this is called leapfrog integration. And I think it's probably the most popular one for a lot of like, very simple physics and like, easy implement implementation. Any questions about that? This is the last little piece left over from our, our, our previous lecture. Um, right, so this is our, uh, uh, our staggered grid uh, story here. Um, uh, and in particular, uh, when we remove the V dependence, it becomes an exploit integrator. The other thing to know, which is kind of cool, by the way, is that this is what we call a reversible ODE, which is kind of interesting. So in general, here's a, a fun fact about uh, ordinary differential equations. So like, what happens if I kind of just flip the sign of F here? Uh, right, I kind of like reverse time and, and, and run the whole thing backwards, right? And for a lot of ODEs, they're reversible. I can do that. That's, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, so one, one nice property here is that at least in a situation where there's no V dependence, this is actually discreetly reversible, meaning that like if I just flip all the forces in my physical system and flip the velocities, it'll go backward on precisely the same path where you went forward before, which is oftentimes not the case for, for numerical integration. That makes sense? Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, and here's a, a nicer version of our, our, our diagram. Okay. So anyway, sorry, that was just a bit quick addendum to our previous lecture. We didn't quite get around to it last time. So this is just one, one more integrator. So just to summarize our numerical integration story really quickly for ODEs, again, what were the three things that we really should consider when we're choosing an integrator? Do you guys remember? Stability is one. Accuracy and efficiency. All right. Well, at least one guy gets it. Um, that's right, and remember that all of these integrators are different trade-offs between these things, right? Like, for example, the implicit integrators oftentimes were quite stable, but they were not very uh, efficient. Some of the explicit integrators are more efficient, uh, but they're not as stable. Uh, and then methods uh, like, like Newmark and Leapfrog have the advantage that they know a little more about your ODE, and now they can sometimes squeeze out a tiny bit more accuracy uh, without affecting the efficiency. Right? So that's our, our basic story here. Um, this is only the tip of the iceberg. The reason that I mentioned this reversibility property, because it's, it's sort of typical of an aesthetic that you see in numerical ODE integration. So the basic integrators we talked about are perfectly fine approximations of the system, but we can't say a whole lot about their discrete behavior. Right? Like, like we, we've taken time and we've divided it into chunks. Like clearly we're not doing physics anymore. <laughs> we're doing chunky time physics. And then the kind of properties that we've shown in this class are that as our spacing of, of time steps goes to zero, our approximation gets better. Right? A different thing that you could ask is, does for a fixed positive time step, does my integrator resemble real life? Right? We have not answered that question, except a little bit qualitatively, like when we worked with the model equation. Um, and so one way that people engineer that is they pick their favorite property from physics, and they ask, does my integrator conserve that property? And there's many different ones to choose from. So a simple one is, is energy. Right? So a lot of the numerical integrators that we talked about do not preserve energy. Right? The implicit ones tend to dampen, meaning that they slow stuff down. The explicit ones tend to add energy to the system. There are other integrators, like leapfrog, which often, as you showed on your homework, I hope, have the property that actually you can just run them for an infinite amount of time, and at least on average, energy doesn't increase or decrease. It just stays the same. But you can imagine it might be a valuable property. Right? Like It captures some aspect of the physical reality that might be really important for your application. That's only the beginning. Uh, structure preservation is a really cool theme. Um, I don't know, what are some of the other structures you might do? You might preserve symmetry, for example. One version of symmetry is reversibility, like what Leapfrog preserves. And I, another might be that like, maybe my forces, when they're like, evenly balanced, I want to make sure that my integrator reflects that, um, and so on. So there's any number of, of different properties people will choose. And they'll work really, really hard to design integrators that preserve that stuff. This is a really fun space. It's like a, a cool little corner of, of math, I think. 
So as a small advertisement, if you take my graduate geometry class, which sadly you can't do for the next like three years apparently, because academic scheduling is hard, um, we'll talk a lot about that theme specifically for discretizing partial differential equations that show up in geometry. So in that case, for example, um, a very, like an example of a very famous uh, property is something called, uh, oh boy, what is it called? Where you integrate Gauss curvature and you get um, what other characteristic? No, that's the Gauss curvature is intrinsic. Well, in any event, there are different notions of curvature, like the bendiness of a, 3D, of a surface in 3D. Um, and there's one of them where if you take the integral over the surface, that thing uh, is equal to a topological environment. gauss bonnet theorem, thank you. Um, the gauss bonnet theorem states that if you take the integral of curvature over a surface, you basically can count the number of holes in the surface. It's like a topological fact. And so you can take discrete notions of curvature, which are kind of like building up divided different versions of, 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 of derivatives, is really all that's going on, just in 2D instead of 1D. And you could ask, can I come up with a version of that that preserves the gauss bonnet theorem? Um, and if you take my, my other class or you poke around on my YouTube channel, you'll see the answer is absolutely yes, you, you can do that um, using some really sneaky tricks that actually kind of resemble high school geometry, which is kind of fun. In any event, um, that, that'll conclude our discussion in numerical integration. Uh, and then the next hour, we can talk about a fun application of all this stuff to uh, machine learning, since in principle, that's sort of the point in this class. Uh, any questions so far? Cool. All right. So in the next uh, uh, 45 minutes, then, I have plenty of time to get myself confused over an interesting application of this stuff, um, which I thought would be kind of a fun thing to do. Um, it's one that uh, Chris has used in some of his research before. So I'm sure he can tell me precisely when I make a mistake. OK. So uh, right. So essentially, what we're going to cover is a particular uh, idea. Uh, this is called a continuous normalizing flow. It's the academic attribution of this is a little tricky because, of course, the machine learning community has like 5 billion ideas per second, and they all overlap because they try to make them overlap. Like roughly, I think uh, people usually ascribe this one to Chen at, oh, I forget the, what conference it is. It was a couple years ago. Um, there's a really fantastic survey, by the way. Um, so I'll point you guys to that, um, which is by Papa Makarios at all, uh, which was in 2021. And this is in the Journal of Machine Learning Research. This is very recent stuff. So here's the basic task that we're going to try and solve, um, which is to parameterize probability distributions in high dimensional spaces. Um, basically, uh, these days, uh, if you were at MIT a couple weeks ago, you saw we had generative AI week, which strangely passed by very quietly in the CS department, but apparently it was a big deal to outside facing folks. Um, which is, I think, more of a bureaucratic challenge than anything else. Um, and uh, of course, in generative AI, essentially you're trying to solve precisely this problem. Right? Like, I'm given a data set, which I'm viewing as a bunch of samples from some distribution, like the set of natural images out there in the universe, I think is the typical example. And then my task is to come up with a sampling thing where I pay in computing power, <laughs> right? I pay like $1 per CPU cycle, which seems to be the price of the Amazon Web Service these days. And in exchange for that, I get like, you know, an AI generated image, right? And every time I put in more computation, I just get this stream of images that come out, right? And we're going to model this with some probability language and then show how people use ordinary differential equations to actually solve this stuff. This actually is one of the models that I think people are using. I mean, every other day we switch from one popular thing to the next in this community, but it is one of the sort of feasible uh, paths. So here's one of the, the kind of ways that we might parameterize a sampling, a piece of sampling procedure which is that on the computer, it's very easy to sample random variables from a bell curve. Right? This is the thing we know how to do. Um, and in fact, actually, we even talked earlier in this class. Remember, we came up with like a strategy for, for doing this kind of thing. And so in particular, we're going to have some distribution. I'm going to draw it in one dimension, but typically the dimension is like several thousand. I don't, um, there's like some magic number that people tend to use, but that's all mythology. But, but in any event, we have some very simple distribution that we know how to sample from like a bell curve, okay? Or if we're, we're feeling like fancy mathematicians, we can call this a Gaussian distribution, okay? And we're gonna call this random variable u. We're gonna say that it is drawn from some probability distribution p psi. 
Okay, so we write code and it generates things that are normally distributed, which is really boring version of generative AI. <laughs> well, it's, it's very generative, not very AI. Okay, and now what happens in these continuous normalizing flows, and normalizing flows more generally, and in fact in, in generative adversarial networks and all kinds of other models for, 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 for generative stuff, is the following. There's some distribution which I find to be more interesting. Like, for example, uh, the distribution of photographs on the internet. It's a troubling distribution. And it has some other shape. It's probably a very complicated one, but we're on the board, so let's say our distribution has two bumps instead of one. <laughs> okay? This is the distribution of photographs. This is a Gaussian. Obviously, this is a very simplified image of what's going on. Yeah? So in the normalizing flow universe, what we do is we learn a mapping, which we're going to call T theta. So theta is going to be like the parameters, like the unknown uh, things that we're optimizing for in our problem. And the basic idea of our generative model is as follows. We randomly draw some u from our Gaussian distribution. And now we push it through T theta. And what we're going to get is a second variable. We're going to call it x, which is sampled from some other distribution. We can say maybe, uh, eh. Well, it's sampled from some other distribution that we don't know. <laughs> I don't think we need to give it notation quite yet. OK? So like, for example, here, I take, I draw a bunch of, like, I flip a bunch of coins, right? That's what what's, happens here. And then I do a very complicated calculation to take that just, like, really noisy pile of numbers and then make it look more and more like an image. Does that make sense? Yes? Uh, well, have you ever played with, uh, what are some examples of tools that people play with? I mean, chat GPT is a little complicated because of text. Uh, Stable diffusion, or another one is Dali, right? This is precisely what they do, right? They, all the computer knows how to do is to draw from this distribution, but it really would like to draw from a very complicated one, right? That's right. Um, so in that case, you would call this the, the sort of conditional version of this problem, where like this procedure, T theta, knows about your text prompt. But for now, we're going to consider the slightly easier task where like, you just want to randomly, like you have, for example, a data set of photos of cats, and I just want to generate another cat. Um, or for example, there's this website, right, thishumandoesnotexist.com, which just generates faces, and that would be an example of like this kind of thing. Yes? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of really troubling things that people do with these AI tools these days. Um, yeah. But in any event, so what would t, t theta look like? like? Let's say that we just want a bimodal distribution. That's what we'd like to sample from, but what we know how to sample from is this unimodal thing. Then maybe what t theta does is it like kind of compresses samples, right? So it's like some map that looks kind of like this, right? You know, kind of clumps things close to the two means, right? So t theta could be a very complicated map. The idea is that x, which is equal to t theta, of u is distributed in some way that we want. Right? And so the typical setup here is that we have a bunch of samples from this thing over here, right? like a data set of images, right? that's these little x's, and we want a new procedure that gets things that are distributed kind of like our samples. Does the test make sense? Fantastic. OK. So here's kind of an interesting thing. So what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and engineer T uh, theta here. Oops, for some reason. Do, 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 do. That's okay. Um, we're going to try and, and, and parameterize T theta to be an invertible, invertible map. Okay? And why do we like to do that? Well, hopefully we kind of remember how probability density functions work. Um, in particular, what is the likelihood of seeing a particular x? Well, it's the likelihood of drawing the corresponding u, right? So like if u uh, here, so we're going to say x is equal to t theta of u, like that, right? So it's the likelihood of drawing u plus the distortion of t. Right, and, and so we can write that as absolute value of determinant of j t theta of u. To be a little bit careful, inverse. Okay? 
So this is basically just integral change of variables, right? It's saying that like the likelihood of drawing an x is the likelihood of drawing its pre-image plus the squashing factor, which got you to the u. Does that make sense? This is our optional topic for the day, by the way. So like, we don't need to get quite as hung up on the details as, as before. I'm going to keep saying that mostly because I'm going to get the details wrong. OK. <sighs> right. So the question, I mean, how would we probably, you know, in this day and age, how would we probably parameterize our unknown map t theta? Well, the obvious thing would be like some kind of neural network, right? Or like some very complicated function that inputs things in like Rn and outputs another thing in Rn. So a map from like noise to images, for example. Does that make sense? But unfortunately for us, a generic neural network is probably a very complicated function of Rn. It's certainly not invertible. And so essentially, the whole idea of normalizing flows is going to be to find some sneaky parameterization of invertible maps that still uses neural networks under, under the hood. Right? And by the way, I'm leaving the leapfrog integrator up on the screen, because what was one of the properties we had of the leapfrog integrator? We could flow time backward. right? If you think about it, that's precisely the property we're going to need to construct this map t theta. Right? Because I can predict the future of my ordinary differential equation. So like for instance, like I swing a pendulum for 10 minutes and then I figure out the position. Then if my, my differential equation is reversible, I flip the velocity, I go 10 minutes in the reverse direction, I can figure out the initial configuration. So in other words, it's an invertible map. Like, uh-oh. Yeah? So essentially what's going to end up being learnable is our, our differential equation. Okay, sorry, spoiler alert. So like, uh, let's think about the kind of applications uh, people might have of these things. I think the very typical application here, again, is I have a big data set drawn from this distribution down here, and now I want to sample more things that look like this distribution. Right? So like, I have a bunch of images, and I want to start sampling new images. So let's see how uh, we might want to do that. One simple model for this is something we can call a maximum likelihood. Uh, estimation, uh, which is going to combine a few topics in this class. Right now we're going to use ODE integration and also optimization. In particular, uh, what we often do is we use something called the forward KL divergence uh, optimization uh, objective function here. The basic idea here is that I actually have two different probability distributions. Let's say that I have a, a particular theta. right? Now, what can I do? I have the distribution I get by drawing samples here, pushing them forward, and just seeing what I get. And then I have a different distribution, which is the actual distribution of photos. And I want these two things to be as close as possible. Right? And so the question that you have to ask is, what is the right notion of close here? Right? And in particular, there's one notion. Actually, there are many notions of close. I developed my entire PhD on one of them. And of course, we're going to do the less interesting one. Um, but the less interesting one is something called Kale divergence. Have we encountered Kale before? Probably if you've taken an inference class. It's OK. Um, if you haven't, uh, it's very simple. It says that if, if I have two different probability distributions, P and Q, so these are our likelihood functions. They're telling me for a given point x how likely it is that I'm going to draw that thing from my distribution. This is equal to the integral of P of x log P of x over Q of x. We don't have time to go into too many details uh, today, but there are a lot of really beautiful properties of Kale divergence. It comes from information theory. And one of them is that it kind of behaves like a distance. Right? So for example, Kale is equal to 0 when P is, is, and Q are the, the same probability distribution. And as P and Q become different, uh, Kale gets large. Right? So it makes perfect sense to say, minimize the Kale divergence between the data that I observe and the, the thing that my, my neural network is producing. Cool. I warned you today would be kind of a weird, funny topic. Um, yes? Uh, you can use a comma instead. The two very vertical bars are just tradition in this area. So uh, if, uh, it turns out in information theory, this is the number of bits that it takes to approximate P with Q or the other way around. And so it's not symmetric, unlike a distance. And so uh, I think that's why they use the bars is to distinguish from like a distance function where you can swap the inputs and get the same thing. This is conjecture. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> OK. Um, one thing that's useful to know, what is the log of p over q? Can we come with any good expressions for that? Paul knows. He's making a face. What's, how, what's a different thing I can do? I can subtract. That's absolutely right. So this is equal to the integral p 
uh, log p minus the integral p log q, like that. Incidentally, what is the integral of p log p? Does anybody know? This is called entropy, uh, minus the entropy, really. Uh, okay, and here's a different thing you can do. If I integrate a function against p, this is what we call expected value, right? This is like saying that I randomly draw something from p um, and assign it value of whatever it's getting integrated against, right? So we can write very different notation, which is an expectation of some sample x drawn from p, right? So in other words, like I draw something distributed like p of log p of x minus log q of x. Cool? These are all different expressions for the same quantity. Andrew, you look confused. We're going to do to help you out. Is this mutual information? It's very close. Yeah. In my mind, all of information theory is basically like two numbers and, and like the rest of it's just notation. But, you know, that's because I'm not in that field. Okay, uh, fantastic. So this is a quantity, and remember, our goal here is going to be to minimize it. So in particular, uh, when we say KL divergence, here's a kind of interesting thing we can do. We can say, okay, I'm going to make a loss. When we say loss, this is like optimization objective function theta, and we're going to measure the KL divergence between the distribution of actual photographs on the Internet, which we can call P star. Right? This is the thing we don't really have access to, but we're trying to approximate relative to the distribution that our uh, neural network is generating, which we'll call p theta. Okay? Now, here's the thing that people often ascribe great value, meaning to, but I think the reality is that people are just engineers about it. Notice, like, I, actually going back to, to Axel's question here, right, we had a choice, which is which of the guys to put first and which one to put second. And Kale is not symmetric, so if I flip these two, I'll get a different thing. There's a sneaky reason why we, but like it sort of looks like a distance regardless. It's, it's like some weird asymmetric notion of distance. And, it, and again, the way to think about it is, is like how good is approximating p star with p theta is actually not the same as, as the other way around. Um, here's the reason. So in particular here, we're going to have a p star in the first term, and then the q is going to become p theta, right, in, in our expression before. And what is our unknown variable? It's actually theta. Right? So does this entropy term actually matter at all in our optimization? No. So we can just slice that term out. Isn't that sneaky? So in particular, this is going to equal a constant, which is basically this first term here, minus an expectation. Uh, okay, the expectation is drawn from P star of what quantity? Well, it's going to be log of p theta, oops, sorry, p theta of x. Make sense? And now we can plug in this expression here. We actually have an expression for, 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 for p theta in terms of a known function and basically our neural network. Okay? In particular, what is this thing? Well, it's equal to a constant minus the expectation of x drawn from p theta, which again, remember, means like randomly draw something from my distribution and then evaluate this number in average, right? Of log of um, maybe p psi of uh, t theta inverse of x plus log of the absolute value of the determinant of my map. Um, OK, so let's, let's uh, see this expression. I wanted to write it first, and then we'll explain. So we have this expression here. So I plug that in to p theta there. There's a log, right? So this is a product, so I can separate that into a sum, right? So the first term in the sum is just the likelihood, but this is the likelihood of u. Right? So I need to invert t and apply it to x. Right? I need the pre-image of my sample x. And then plus log of the determinant of j. But that's just this term here. Make sense? So 
first of all, this is a really cool thing because notice when it comes to dependence on my data distribution, like on this thing, like the distribution of actual photographs, where do I need it? I just need it here, right? And how do I approximate this thing? I just draw photographs from my data set and I evaluate this quantity at that photograph. Right? And I average these, these values together. That make sense? So really, in order to do this uh, uh, optimization, what am I going to need? I'm going to need to be evalu to evaluate t theta inverse, right? And I'm going to need the Jacobian of that. Make sense? So this is the kind of application, but in order to do all of this stuff, I need to parametrize a set of invertible maps t theta. And sadly for us, neural networks don't tend to be invertible. Right? So that's what's missing in our, 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 the missing ingredient of our story here. Okay. Um, by the way, the phrase normalizing flow minus continuous is just the, like a, there are all kinds of different classes of invertible maps. Continuous normalizing flows are one which are particularly convenient and aligned to the goals of this course. So, so that's fine. Okay. So, so far, this is just inspiration for continuous normalizing flows. Our next task is to actually fill in the CNF part. Any questions so far? But notice that this is a well-posed optimization problem. And literally, if I can find the min with respect to theta here, and it, then what I've done is made <laughs> generative AI. <laughs> I've made a tool that can produce photographs from, from Gaussian noise, which is what we set out to do. By the way, these are like literally state-of-the-art tools. This is not like some fun theoretical problem from the 1700s. OK, so we need another board. This is even more ad-libbed than our normal lecture. Uh, so we have two remaining pieces. One is to define a continuous normalizing flow. And then time permitting, we're going to talk about how to differentiate that thing. As usual in this class, we'll do one in detail, and then the other we'll get halfway through, run out of time, and I'll start waving my arms around. That's the plan. So get excited. OK, so in particular, for all of this machinery to work, I need to be able to parametrize a really expressive class of maps that have an inverse. Right? And like just a generic neural network doesn't have that property. For example, if I set all the weights to zero, then my map is just maps everything to zero, which is clearly not invertible. And that, I think, is one of the more innocent non-invertible neural networks as they go. <laughs> yeah? um, so instead, we, we do something else, which is in the uh, continuous normalizing flow universe, here's going to be the object that we learn. We learn a function, which we can call maybe g theta. And g theta is going to be a function of t and a variable z. Okay? And here maybe t, it doesn't really matter, but we can say t is between 0 and 1, maybe. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do here. Um, so g is going to be a neural network, but we're not going to use it in the way that's suggested on our previous board. Like, we're not just going to take samples from u and stick it into g. Instead, here's our, uh, our, our, our procedure here. We are going to solve an ODE, which is dz dt, is equal to g of t c. And we're going to say that z at time 0 is equal to u. So what does this look like? We, we draw a Gaussian. Oh, wait, if we go back to our picture here. We can think of g as like little vectors, right? So it's like little directions that are sitting in the space in between these two guys, like that, right? And that's our neural network. This could be a very complicated a vector field. But one way or another, our sampling procedure draws a point here and then just uses an ODE solver to make its way to the sample of the other. And so the variables here are like the directions of the arrows. Does that make sense? Now here's the fun thing. This is actually an invertible map. In particular, here's the, the fundamental theorem of calculus. If I integrate both sides of this thing, right? So I get what? z1 is equal to z0 plus the integral from 0 to 1 of g theta t z of t dt. Right? So this is saying that if I know z0, then I can use like forward Euler or RK or whatever my favorite integrator is to predict z1, right? That's, that's what we did the last two lectures. Moreover, because this is a first order ODE, we can actually do a second thing. We can flip the whole thing backward. 
we can say, okay, z1 is equal to z0. Oh, no, but I, I, that's not what I meant. Um, z0 is equal to z1 plus the integral from maybe 1 to 0 of, oh boy, uh, minus g theta g z. Do these two minuses cancel out? Yeah, I'm bad at calculus. This is, like, is this the correct thing to do? I don't know. Whatever. We, we, we flip our vector field backward and go, <laughs> go the other direction in time. And then what we're going to get is a sample from Z0. Right? So in other words, our map is completely invertible. Given Z0, I can get Z1. Given Z1, I can get Z0 by just flipping my vectors backward, which is easy to do in code and weirdly hard to do on the board, I'm realizing now. <laughs> okay. So this is really cool because we have a neural network where we've got this learnable object, but it is guaranteed that our sampler is invertible, which is what we wanted. Right? Um, this basic idea, by the way, is sometimes called neural ODE. It won an award at NeurIPS a couple of years ago. This is a very popular technique. Cool? So again, basically what we're doing is we're using our neural network to parameterize a flow rather than using our neural network to just parameterize a map. Clever, huh? And by the way, uh, one interesting thing, uh, which I think is kind of cool, notice that this, for example, if I wanted to do maximum likelihood estimation, I actually need the density at time one of my samples, not just to be able to draw samples. Like this thing tells me how to draw stuff, but it doesn't tell me how to get P, right? But in fact, there's a, a fun thing that you can check, uh, which is the, f uh, uh, the following. Um, I think we're going to skip the proof of this uh, now, which is... We can think of z as a random variable, right? As a, so like z at time one half is the random variable where I sample the u and I flow for half time, right? And from that perspective, it makes perfect sense to talk about its probability density. And one thing that you can show uh, is the following. That this is actually equal to minus the trace of uh, the Jacobian of g. Oh. I wrote something nonsensical. Uh, right. <laughs> Z, T, like that. So in other words, there's actually an ODE that I can solve also for the density, which is kind of cool. So I can first do my ODE integration to draw a sample, right? And now notice that now I have a, a path ZT. And given that path, I can now integrate the second ODE to get the density by, by essentially doing forward Euler steps where I take the trace of the copian of, 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 of G at each step. So basically, everything becomes an ordinary differential equation. Getting the density becomes an ODE. Getting the samples becomes an ODE. Everything is beautiful here. OK? And so that's this basic idea of neural ODE, is uh, that we can, we can draw samples from an invertible map by drawing samples at time 0 and using a learnable vector field to push them forward to time 1. Does that make any sense? Isn't that cool? This is a really sneaky trick. I think this is really clever. So. Um, by the way, there, there's uh, two details, one of which uh, is very easy to address, and the other of which is a giant pain. And lucky for us, we have 30 minutes, so we have plenty of time to get it wrong. <laughs> okay? Um, and and that, that's the following. First of all, this is, like, like, how big is this thing? So Z is like an image, right? It's like a photograph. Right? So the Jacobian of this is photograph by photograph big. This is a big matrix. So computing this is very expensive. Right? It's doable. This is backpropagation. J is a neural network, so we know how to differentiate it. We talked about that in this class. But this is a gigantic matrix. Um, so in practice, what people can do is use a, a really sneaky trick. Um, I think we'll leave it out because it's a little outside of the scope of this class. Um, but there's something called the Hutchinson trace estimator. Um, estimator. I'll let you guys Google that later. This is just a clever formula. It has to do with like you can estimate a trace in a random way by like randomly drawing things and then multiplying a, a, a matrix in a vector. It's very easy to derive, actually. So that's uh, issue number one. It's just that like J is a really big matrix. We don't want to derive all of J. So that, that, that estimator turns out that you only end up needing kind of one element of J in a sense. By the way, this is very noisy, so you, you tend to need to do it more than once. There's a second issue, which is how do you get the derivative? In particular, 
notice that I have a loss in terms of like psi evaluated at the solution of an ODE, <laughs> right? And so now I need, like, how am I going to optimize this thing? I'm going to differentiate my loss with respect to theta, which means differentiating some function of my sample push forward through this ODE integrator at time one. It's a very complicated function to differentiate. Does that make sense? So that's going to be issues uh, number two. And there's sort of two different ways to do it. And I think the community ping pong back and forth between which one is more effective. Strategy number A is to not worry about it. Um, <laughs> in particular, uh, we can use back propagation through the integrator. Integrator. So if you think about it, like let's say that I solve this ODE using forward Euler. Right? So that's how I'm going to predict my, my samples from my neural network. Well, I can just store all of the steps of forward, integrate, of, of forward Euler and then differentiate through them like as if it were just a giant formula. <laughs> um, and, and that's actually perfectly fine, but it's extremely memory intensive. I think, I think currently, like this week, <laughs> this is people's preferred strategy. You know, next week it'll probably ping pong back and forth to the other one. But my student Jack tells me this is, this is the one people do now. Um, but there's a second, which is kind of fun. It's actually very popular, I think, in the AeroAstro community, so I thought it's worth a mention. Um, and this is something called the adjoint method. And this is a strategy which actually is not just to, to uh, neural ODE. This is a very general trick which applies in lots of different settings, so I thought it was worth a, a, a quick uh, mention in this course. It was actually on my list as the last thing to cover, so by some miracle, we managed to time out the contents of this course correctly. I say that with 25 minutes left. OK, so here's going to be our goal for the remainder of today's lecture is to derive this cool approximation of the uh, derivative. And here's going to be the basic idea of the adjoint method, which is really cool formula and super weird, is it says the following. Let's say that I have some ODE, which remember is like a little vector field sitting in space, like that, right? And I define a function in a very complicated way, where I take some point, it's like drawn from some distribution, I flow it through my ODE at a unit of time. I evaluate my loss function at the, 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 the final point here. And now what I want to know, right, so maybe this is u and this is x, right? And then I have some loss function that I've evaluated at x. Or maybe more generally, a loss function that's evaluated all along this path, right? And now what I want is d times the loss function, d the parameters of my, my problem. And the way that I'm going to do it is rather than keeping track of all these different steps, I'm actually going to write a second ODE that kind of flows backward and looks like back propagation, but in some continuous fashion. This is a really sneaky trick. And the, what is the, the advantage of that? Remember that back propagation requires you to remember all of the steps of your formula, right? When we talked about backward automatic differentiation, you've got to like build up this giant expression tree and keep it around. That's very expensive, especially with these integrators, because the reality is they're making this like extensive set of samples which are, are all over the place. There's a bunch of stuff to remember along the way. So instead, uh, what happens to the adjoint method is you forget all of it. <laughs> and then you solve an ODE that goes in the reverse direction and kind of reconstructs your path uh, as needed. Okay? And so we're going to fill in the details of that for the, for the remainder of our, our lecture here. Any questions so far? Okay, this is where the stuff begins to hit the other stuff, so we'll see how far we get. Um, especially because my notes are like covered in scribbles and frowny faces, and like I think I got a bunch of major transposes wrong, but then I got confident this morning, and I was like, yeah, in class we'll get it right. Because that's always what happens, you know, like the best way to write the correct value of a formula is to do it in front of a bunch of students who are confused. Okay. So let's uh, make our problem a little better defined. Um, By the way, we're going to write one instance of the uh, adjoint method. There are many different versions of this formula, but they all kind of have the same proof. Um, and it's going to look a little something like this. And I tried to convert it. I got this from a research paper that showed up last year that had a little proof in the appendix that I thought was clean. Um, but I didn't like the notation, so I tried to convert it to our course notation, which is going to be one of many sources of error in our proof. <laughs> okay, but in any event, here's going to be my setup. I have an ODE, which is a function f of t and y, right? So far, it's what we normally have. But now, I'm going to have a set of parameters theta, which is like the thing that's messing around with the weights of my neural network. 
By the way, this also shows up in inverse problems. So for example, um, let's say that I want to design a pendulum <laughs> with the property that I let the pendulum go from some height, I wait 10 seconds, and after 10 seconds the pendulum is back here. Right? And maybe the parameters of my pendulum are the length of the stick and the mass attached to the end of it. Right? Then I could put the parameters here, and for each set of parameters I get a different ODE. Right? I'm trying to solve some optimization problem in terms of theta. Right? So uh, here the y prime is in terms of t. Right? So, so, so the theta is like this external set of information. Everybody understand the setup? Okay. Now I'm going to introduce, oh, by the way, we'll say y of 0 equal to some y naught. Now, neural ODE, there's an added complication, which is why not, is also drawn from the distribution, but we're going to ignore that for now. Okay. Now, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to define some loss to the function of theta, and it's going to be the integral from 0 to maybe 1 of uh, a function g of t y of t theta. Okay. Um, so here, the basic idea is, I reconstruct my path, right, so I have a path like that, and now, at each point in time, I have some loss function, which measures something about the path, right? Um, and then this is integrated over all time. So for example, maybe I have, I don't know, a double pendulum, and I want to maximize the amount of time that the double pendulum spends close to me, right? That would be some random obstacle control problem to solve. Does this notation make sense to everybody? I have a loss function, I've got an ODE, my loss is in terms of solutions to the ODE. Okay. So there are a lot of different ways to, to, to solve and think about this problem, and, and I went through a bunch of different proofs of adjoint method, and I hated most of them because I felt like they just like pull a formula out of their, their tuchus and then just like check that it's correct, which is like not a great way to do math. Um, and so I, I tried to develop a little bit of intuition, and here's how I thought about it. Like, we can really think of this as the following. In some sense, I have, like, two variables. I have y of t, or it's unknown in the sense that I have to solve my ODE, right? And then the other variable I have is theta. Yeah? So in particular, that's like some optimization problem. Like that, right? And my objective function is L of theta. And what is my constraint? Well, it's kind of like y prime equals f of t y theta, right? And y is 0 equals 0, or equals y 0. Like, uh, you guys agree that like, this is really the optimization problem I'm trying to solve? By the way, this is my own explanation, so it could easily be wrong. Right? Now, here's a problem, and one that we really haven't tackled in this class. It's a little ambitious of me to do it in the last 30 minutes of this course. Y of t is a function. It's a function of t, right? We've had our optimization problems so far haven't had unknown functions. They've had unknown vectors. So this is a little different. But does everybody agree, like, somehow, at least in principle, this is, this is what's going on? Now, what kind of problem is this? This is constrained optimization. And what do we do with constrained optimization in this class? That's right, we do Lagrange multipliers. Paul agrees. So, when we do Lagrange multipliers, what is our Lagrangian function here? Okay, a uh, quick, uh, quick choose your own adventure here. Would you guys prefer that I use notation that matches this class but is slightly more likely for me to get wrong because it doesn't match my notes, or a notation that matches my notes but is slightly more accurate because it matches my notes? You guys like matches this class. All right, you're brave. So in my Lagrangian, what do I do? Remember, I take my loss function, and then I subtract off from it, or the, 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 the Lagrange multiplier multiplied by my constraint. Right? But here, I've got a problem, which is that my unknown is a function. And in fact, notice that this is a constraint for all t. There's infinitely many constraints, one for every t. So if you kind of think spiritually, I need a Lagrange multiplier which is also a function of t, right? Because there's infinitely many constraints. One, of, one constraint per t, so I'm going to index it like that. Does that make sense? By the way, if you're looking for a search term later, what I'm doing secretly is something called variational calculus. Don't tell. OK. But only like baby version of it. So we're going to call this thing L is a function of theta 
And also, uh, in fact, we're going to match the notation in this class. Oh, God. Um, we're going to call this thing capital lambda uh, and uh, my Lagrange multiplier lambda of t. Which again, it's an unknown function, right? Oh, I'm sorry. We need a y in there, too. Okay, and again, remember the Lagrange multiplier, hopefully by now this is like turn the crank in this class. What do you do? You take the objective, you start to subtract off the, you know, you add like lambda times the constraint. So the objective in this case is L. Let's go ahead and fill it in. So it's integral from 0 to 1 of G of T, Y of T, oops, T theta, like that, dt. And now I need the product between my constraint and my unknown, okay? And in particular, here's a way to write it. I need the product of uh, lambda of t times, well, what is my constraint? It's like y prime equals f of, of stuff, right? So in particular, I can say that this is y prime of t minus f of t y of t uh, theta. This whole integral is dt. Does everybody see how this is kind of like the Lagrangian of our problem? Okay. By the way, this math actually does check out, but you have to be really careful about function spaces and all kinds of stuff we're not going to think about here. Okay. So, in other words, like a critical point of this object is, is really what we're seeking. Okay? Now, here's going to be our, our mathematical sleight of hand. We're going to call this thing the Lagrangian, but we're, we're going to try and we're, notice that like the goal of the adjoint method is not to just minimize, it is to find a, a derivative, right? It's a slightly different task. I'm trying to compute DLD theta, I'm not trying to just minimize yet. I'm going to use DLD theta to minimize some function, but like for now, our, our job is to just estimate it, even if theta is not optimal yet. Okay? But regardless, I think what we can say is that Lagrangian is a completely reasonable object to work with. This was this little step that I added to this argument to just kind of motivate where this, this formula comes from. Because eventually what we're going to do is we're going to use this thing, but we're not going to like take the first variation of this. Like we're not going to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. Okay. If that didn't parse, it's okay. That's, that's just a fancy uh, math word. Okay. So in this class, we only know how to do one thing, uh, and that's integrate by parts. Actually, no, that's sorry, that's my other class. Um, but, but, but basically, you know, notice that I have an integral here. I've got a derivative there. It's multiplied against the, some other thing. So like screaming out in your high school calculus brain, you should be like, oh my god, I can integrate this thing by parts. Like, by George, I will integrate this function by parts, because I don't have anything else better to do. Yeah? Okay, so in other words, we can come up with another expression for Lagrangian, which is exciting, I think. So in particular, remember how integration by parts works? Like I can basically take a derivative and pop it onto the other guy in exchange for a minus sign and then stuff evaluated at the endpoints? Okay, so in particular, what am I gonna get? I'm gonna get lambda of t, y of t, evaluated at zero and one. Notice there's a minus here, by the way, so I need a minus sign. And now I can rewrite the rest of this integral. So we're going to have the integral of 0 to 1. We, we still got this first term, which we're not integrating by parts. So this is g of t, y of t, theta. Um, this guy we've integrated by parts. Um, so in particular, we have plus, because the sign flipped when we integrated by parts, um, we can say this is y of t dot product lambda prime of t, right? The derivative swapped. That's integration by parts. Um, minus, oops, these minus and this minus cancel. So we have plus lambda t uh, inner product with f t y t theta. Everybody with me so far? This is kind of fun, right? Okay, so we've, we've integrated by parts, um, which is what we, we aimed to do. Um, and in particular, now we have three terms, right? We've got one, we got, uh, do, 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 do. I'm mapping this onto my notes, two, and three. Actually, I actually feel like this is going smoother than I thought. I thought I'd get it wrong by now. We're already halfway through the page. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna move this up to the top board. Now here's going to be where our math, 
differentiate, ah, different. Uh, diverges a little slightly from, from other proofs we've done in this class, right? In, in the past, like when we've done least squares and stuff, we've just taken Lagrangian and set it equal to zero. But now we're just going to consider the Lagrangian to be an interesting object in itself. <laughs> we can certainly define this function, big lambda, of uh, theta y and lambda here, right? And, and this is a thing I can evaluate for any theta, any y, and any lambda, even if they don't satisfy the constraint. But now, Now we're going to get creative. In particular, oh, actually, maybe we'll do one additional uh, simplification of this, this expression here. Um, we, can, we can group some terms uh, together, maybe. Do I want to do that? Sorry, I'm thinking a little bit. OK, yeah. So let's consider the following case. Suppose y of t satisfies the ODE, okay? So we, we, we know that, that Y actually satisfies this thing. Moreover, uh, let's say um, we're going to choose, sorry, A of 1 to equal 0. And then we're going to add a third thing uh, to a of 1 later, but, but we're going to add that later, <laughs> okay? Now notice, when y satisfies the ODE, how do we define big L, or, or uh, lambda here? It's just the objective function minus this thing. If y satisfies the ODE, notice that like the second term isn't really there, right? So in particular, If y satisfies the ODE, oops, I wrote a, and you guys all agree with me, but I haven't actually used the letter a at all in this proof. This should be lambda. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is a good indicator of how much people are following my lecture. Um, yeah, that would be a different a, but no, this, this a is just wrong. <laughs> okay, uh, right. So here's the, the idea. If y satisfies the ODE, then in particular, we have that L and little l, big L and little, ah, big lambda and little l agree, right? Because that, that term that we added to lambda is just zero. Yeah? And this is true regardless of A. Of, lam of lambda. Sorry, at this point, you know it's in my notes. <laughs> right? I can choose any lambda and Big lambda is equal to L, right? Because it's just multiplied by a, a, a giant zero. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, why am I going to do that? Well, here's a, a fun thing I can do. D little l d theta, right? Because remember, that's the quantity that we want at the end of the day, right? Well, this is equal to B lambda d theta in this case, because these guys are equal to one another, so long as we keep little lambda constant, right? So uh, what is this thing going to equal? Well, now I have to go to our expression. I've got to differentiate this whole thing with respect to theta, which is like mildly annoying. OK? OK. So in particular, we are going to say that lambda, we're just going to choose a constant lambda that does not depend on theta. It doesn't even matter what it is. OK? And for any such lambda, well, what does depend on theta? Well, y does, right? Because y really is a flow of, of my ODE, which is determined by theta. Right? So I've got to be a little careful when I, I differentiate. Does that make sense? So by the way, for now, we're going to think of, of theta as just a one-dimensional parameter. It's very easy to extend this argument. I just don't feel like thinking about matrices, and we're low on time. OK. So in particular, when I do that, what am I going to get? Well, going back to our previous formula, I'm going to get minus lambda t dy d theta of t, like that, right? That's differentiating through this, this first term. I'm going to get plus, then you're going to go from 0 to 1 of a bunch of stuff. Get excited. we got so many partial derivatives that are about to happen. Do you see that? Um, in particular, notice that like g depends on y and theta, but y also depends on theta. So I actually have two terms here. I have d, g, d, 
theta, and then um, plus d g d y d y d theta, right? So that's the partial derivative of term number one. And this is accounting for the derivative with respect to y and the derivative with respect to theta of g. Okay. Now we've got term number two. Well, this one's easier because lambda we decided has no theta, theta dependence, right? So this is just dy d theta dot product with uh, lambda prime t. Um? Oh, this is the chain rule. Um, so g has basically theta actually appears in two slots of g because y is itself a function of theta. And I have to account for both of those when I differentiate this thing with respect to theta. So this guy is, a, is differentiating with respect to the third input. This one is differentiating with respect to the second input. Okay. So this is term number two differentiated. Incidentally, at this point, we have diverged completely from my notes. So like, we're, we're winging it. We'll see. <laughs> okay. Um, and then plus, uh, well, there's a third thing, which is lambda of t dot product with the derivative of big F with respect to theta, which actually has the same problem, right? So, so now we, we again end up with uh, two terms, right? So we have d f d y d y d theta plus d f d theta. Okay. This is a much cleaner formula than my notes, which which makes me very suspicious. Okay, and this is uh, term number three when I differentiate with respect to theta. And this is, and it's important to remember, like, what have we, what have, we, <laughs> what on earth have we done? Uh, we have chosen. We said, okay, lambda is just some arbitrary function, but it has no theta dependence, right? And we've assumed that y satisfies the ODE. Maybe it even satisfies it for all theta, right? So as I change theta, the y's change too. Does that make sense? So really, by the way, I've been writing y of t, but it's like really y of t comma theta, if you think about it. Okay? So now I take my previous expression, and I say, well, for all theta, L uh, and, 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 and big lambda are equal to one another, right? Just because we, big lambda is nothing more than L plus basically zero, <laughs> right? But now I differentiate through this thing with respect to theta, and this is the giant expression that I got. And this feels hopeless. <laughs> I mean, this looks big and ugly and scary, okay? because it is. Okay, um, right. But now what we're going to do is we're going to regroup ever so slightly. And then we're going to be good. Okay. So here's going to be the trick. So first of all, by the way, let's, let's expand this. This is going to be convenient. So we have minus lambda of 1 dy d theta of 1 plus lambda of 0 dy d theta of 0. Right, so that's this first expression. Okay. And now we've got plus the integrator from zero, integral from zero to one. And now what I'm going to do is notice that I've got a dy d theta here, I've got a dy d theta there, and I've got a dy d theta here. Yeah? So let's factor all those guys out. In particular, I'm going to get uh, the following. Ah, <laughs> not that weird symbol, which isn't a real symbol. I'm simultaneously sad that our math student isn't here today, but also glad because I'm sure I've made mistakes. Okay. Um, so first we have dg dy. Check. Uh, um, we need plus lambda prime. Oh. Uh, there appears already to be a check there. Uh, and then we need a third one, which is df dy times uh, lambda t. Right. And those are all the terms that involve dy d theta. Make sense? Okay. And then what are we left with? We still got uh, two other terms, right? There's this one and there's this one, right? So we have plus uh, dg uh, d theta. Check. Plus lambda t dot product df d theta. Cool? 
Okay. So, here's gonna be, here's the sneaky trick. And this is the sneaky trick of uh, uh, the adjoint method. Remember that this thing holds for any lambda so long. In fact, actually, we haven't even used the fact that lambda of one equals zero yet, right? Let's go ahead and use that, by the way. We know, okay, so lambda of one equals zero. <laughs> Great, got rid of a term. In fact, by the way, we can also choose dy d theta at zero is also zero, right? Because remember, y is an ODE, y at time zero is before I solve the ODE. So this also has no theta dependence. Fantastic. So the boundary terms in my uh, integration by parts went away. We're getting somewhere, right? Which is good because I got three minutes. Here's the thing that I can do. I can take lambda, because again, remember this uh, works for any lambda. In particular, I'm going to choose lambda to satisfy a particular ODE, which is lambda prime equals minus dg dy plus df dy lambda. This is an ordinary differential equation. So in particular, I can just say, okay, because remember, what do we know? Well, like, we actually know both of these. These are just constants, right? Because we already know why. We've integrated it forward in time. Well, so now I'm going to just choose lambda to be the thing where I flip time backward, which is what's going to allow me to zero out this term, right? And moreover, satisfies this ODE here, okay? Because again, this expression is true for any choice of lambda, so I might as well be strategic about it and just zero out a giant term here. <laughs> Sneaky? Okay, so then this entire term is zero for that choice of lambda. Again, this whole expression is true for any lambda, now I've made a strategic choice of lambda, basically to just kill off a bunch of terms. And what am I left with? Well, when the smoke clears, I have that dl d theta is equal to the integral from zero to one of dg d theta plus lambda of t times df d theta. Okay? And this is the adjoint method. Now, wait a second. <laughs> Everybody should look confused because, like, oh my god, what just happened? Um, this is so cool. This is such a clever idea. So here, and by the way, this really is just Lagrange multipliers or sensitivity analysis, like, just kind of in disguise. Um, here's what's going on. We introduce this Lagrangian, right? And so long as y satisfies our ODE, the Lagrangian is always equal to the loss. So that's perfectly fine. But the Lagrangian allows us to integrate by parts. It allows us to kind of mess with Lagrange multiplier in a way that we couldn't before. So we went ahead and did that, and in particular, we chose a Lagrange multiplier that basically just zeroes out all the inconvenient terms in our expression. And notice that that was actually a valid choice, because y, uh, lambda prime, it's an ODE that starts at time one and goes backward to time zero, but it, it, remember the ingredients I need for solving an ordinary differential equation. It's nothing more than an expression that looks like this, right? So fantastic. So I simulate y forward in time, and now, because I have the sequence of y's, I can simulate lambda backward in time. So now I have both y and lambda as a function of t. Right? And notice I didn't need any memory, no backpropagation needed. And now, if I wanted dl d lambda, remember that was our giant chain of equality here, well, I have all my ingredients. This is a function of y, this is lambda, this is a function of y. So this whole thing is just a giant sum. So at the end of the day, this is the adjoint method. It says, okay, rather than doing backpropagation, remembering all of the steps it took for me to integrate y forward in time, instead, I integrate forward in time for y, and then basically backward in time, and as I integrate backward lambda and t, I, I, I also can compute this integral, because I now have a bunch of samples, add them all together, and what I get is the appropriate derivative. Now I should be careful. In the like one minute I have remaining, let's think about why this method is good and why it's bad. Why it's good is that unlike backpropagation, no memory was required. I, I integrated forward and backward and, 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 and life is good. On the other hand, there were a lot of approximations I have to do to carry this out of reality, <laughs> right? Because did I actually get y of one? No, I got y of one as approximated by like forward Euler or probably RK4 or whatever. So y of one is already inaccurate. Now I use the y's to solve this differential equation for the lambdas. 
So this is actually inaccurate for two reasons. One is that I can't actually solve this thing. All I could do is discretize it in time. The second is that the DGDYs are also inaccurate because the Ys aren't accurate. <laughs> right? So the error kind of compounds. Yeah? And moreover, this integral here, you don't, we don't know how to do integrals. All we can do is sample Ts and add them together. Right? So at the end of the day, what you get is a thing that looks kind of like GLD data, <laughs> but oftentimes is quite inaccurate. So this is a method that's very popular in optimal control, partial differential equation, all this kind of universe where like, I would like to optimize the parameters of a physical system um, subject to a constraint which looks like making sure that physical system behaves reality. That's the high-level point. Yes, very quick, where's the end of class? Uh, I, I was just going to ask, like, specifically where each place Well, one place it gets used is in neural ODE, right? So, so, that's so that's yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep, in path planning, it's exactly the same kind of problem. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so in path planning, you would say that you what? You roll it forward for the y's, and then you roll it backward for the lambdas. Okay, fantastic. So in any event, folks, uh, our lecture is over. Uh, many thanks for joining us for 6S955. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for your time. Study very hard for your exam. I think we'll probably see all of you in our office hours today and tomorrow. Um, if you have comments about the course, things you want to share, you are, of course, more than welcome to send them to me, or you can share them on your, your course feedback, which, of course, you're encouraged to fill out, both for that reason and because like the longevity of this course really depends on, like, enthusiastic students saying this was a class they wanted to take. Or if you don't, that's great too. I'll go teach a giant machine learning class. That's fine too. So in any event, thank you very much. Have a lovely time. And we will see you in your exam, if not in Chris's uh, office hours of class today. Cool. <laughs>